Um, we've been in a series, if you're new with us, where we are, it's called Family Vacation, and, and we are answering the top six questions that um, this community has asked. We, we asked questions in the springtime, and we voted on them, and we've been answering the top six. Today we're answering uh, the second most asked question, which is, why are Christians such jerks? Uh, which is pretty blunt and in your face, and we will address that next week. We will answer the number one question, the number one question by far, and it is, why would a loving God send somebody to hell? And it's a, it's a, it's a deep question. It's something that we have probably all wrestled with, and so we're going to tackle it head on. I'm, I'm pumped to ask that. And then in two weeks, in two weeks... Um, we're going to start a new series, but you're going to remember two weeks because of another reason. It is uh, T-shirt Sunday. So I am wearing the shirt, Freedom is Here. And on the back has the uh, church website on there as well. But anybody, anybody that comes in two weeks, you have to be there on that Sunday. You have to show up in person or you do not get a t-shirt. But everybody that comes will get a t-shirt, Freedom Church t-shirt that says Freedom is Here. And we really do believe that if you take your next step in your relationship with Jesus, it's that next step towards freedom. It's that relationship with Jesus, that relationship with God that you've always wanted. But it starts with taking that next step. We're in that series, in that series, we're going to be talking about this thing called church. Why are we even here? What is this thing about? What do we value and how do we find freedom in that? Because we believe that this thing is centered around Jesus and his church. And that that's where the freedom is found. But today, today, we're going to be talking about jerks. Why are Christians such jerks? And for the non-Christians in the room, if you're here today and you're a non-Christian, you get a pass. Okay? You get a pass today, and you get to hear some things about Christianity. You can even feel free to kind of be like, oh yeah, that's good. Like, get them, get them, mm, mm. you know. But I do believe also there are some, some things, if, if you're here and you're not a believer in Jesus, that's fine. You don't have to, to believe what we believe to belong. But if you're here and you're not a Christian, I think there's a th some things that you can take with you. And, and some principles that we're going to talk about today that you can take with you. And you're going to find that that's going to really help you out in life as well. For the Christians today. We've got a tough message. We've got a tough one that we need to allow God to, to speak to us and, and, and maybe wrestle with some things in our lives as well. Jerks really are everywhere, not just within the realm of, of Christianity. Okay, I'm a sports fan, so for that dude that comes and, and r ruins the score of the game, because I rarely, if ever, watch a game live. Okay, so I'm on tape delay, and then someone just like, oh, well, you're not going to like the score of that game, and they just totally ruin it for me. Jerks. Somebody who ruins a movie for me, okay? Anybody parents of toddlers that can't make it to the movie theater anymore? All right, I have to wait till it comes out on Netflix before I watch it. So Civil War, people keep your mouth shut because I know nothing about it. And you guys are tra keep trying to, to ruin me. I realize that's a lot on me. The person at the pizza party. They're like, what kind of pizza do you want? And they're like, thin crust. You're like, who are you? Come on, man. Just order... Yeah, just get a salad, okay? It's, if you're going to order pizza, man, deep crust, stuffed crust, do it right. Jerks are everywhere. I could just say, hey, picture a jerk in your mind. Who's, who's someone in your life that's a jerk? And you, you probably don't have to think very hard. Maybe it's that know-it-all. Don't point. I see some of you guys like trying to, to point. Could be that know-it-all know in-law. Um, it could be that person at Smith's. You're in aisle two. And you look up and you see that person in aisle six and you're like, oh, we are not going to cross six times in the next ten minutes here. You know, I'm going to go buy some thin crust pizza somewhere else or something like that, okay? They're everywhere. Maybe it's your kids. Maybe it's your kids. You picture in your kids. You're like, oh, mom, mom, I need this. I need this, this, this. And you're like, get a job. Something. Maybe it's your nagging wife. Don't amen. Do not amen. We gotta, we're going to do a marriage series in November, okay? There's hope there. Maybe it's your disrespectful husband that you're thinking about. Jerks are, are everywhere in our, in our lives. Today, though, today, though, we're going to be talking specifically about the Christian jerk. People in the name of Jesus acting like jerks. And it's been throughout history, 
If you look at history, uh, people can look at the Crusades. People can look at the Spanish Inquisition. You can look at slavery where people were doing horrendous things in history in the name of Jesus. And you can bring it on into today as well. People being judgmental, critical, bitter, angry, argumentative. Does anybody come to mind? I'm sure you can maybe think of a few. And, and while you're thinking of a few and making your list, and I've been preparing all week long, I made my list as well. It's in chronological order. So I thought, well, I'll just go over it. Starting with two weeks ago, Nathan Hughes. You know, I have my parking spot right out there. There's one spot and one spot only with shade. And you took it two weeks ago. Not happy about that, okay? <laughs> Christian jerks, you've encountered them. They were in Jesus' time too. Think about it. People trying to reach Jesus. The, the, the paralytic, his friends, bringing the paralytic, carrying him to Jesus. And what? They couldn't make it to Jesus because the crowd was in the way. The woman with the issue of blood for years hears that Jesus is coming through her town. She goes to meet Jesus. And what? She can't make it to Jesus because the crowd is surrounding. A couple weeks ago, we talked about blind Bartimaeus. And, and blind Bartimaeus heard that Jesus was walking by. And he, he's like, here's my opportunity. I, there's my chance. And he cries out to Jesus for help. And what's the crowd do? Shut up! You're embarrassing us. Do you, do you know who this is? And do you know who you are? And they try to put him in his place. Zacchaeus, he was too small. He couldn't see because of the crowd. It's amazing, it's amazing how church people can keep people, can be the biggest obstacle for people meeting Jesus. And it happened in the, ch in the early church as well. You think about, if you've read through the New Testament... And you read about the early church and how they, they do things. And those, those early church leaders would command things. Not just suggest things, but they would command. They would say, love one another. Forgive one another. Strive for unity. Seek peace. Be peacemakers. Those commands, what? They only make sense, what? If the church was not a perfect place. Why would you strive for all those things if it was a perfect place? The church has always been an imperfect place. And Freedom Church, if you are here long enough, if you are here long enough, you will come across a Christian jerk. If you hang out with me long enough, even though I'm a pastor, you'll be like, that dude is a jerk. It's, it's happened throughout um, Christianity, the church has never been a place for perfect people. It is a place for imperfect people to meet a perfect Savior. And so today I want to I address, why do we do this? Because here's the truth of it. It's easy to think of and, 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 and say that person's a jerk. That's, we can see it in them, right? Right? But the truth of it is, you are the most difficult person that you will face. There are areas in your life, the, I know, the sweet angel you, the perfect you, the, the one who's got it all right, all the time, and everybody else has got it. I know, there is a seed of imperfection in you that sometimes shows its ugly self to the people around you. And so today, today, if we're going to gain any ground today, we need to allow God to show us maybe where, where we have some things in our lives. And I want to try to answer where we, we might have an inner jerk inside of us. And so to answer the question plainly, uh, why are Christians such jerks? Just to be real clear and simple and then we'll dive in, into this. The answer is they're not in step with Jesus. They're not in step with the gospel. There's a, a, a passage in scripture in Galatians. The writer is Paul, who's a leader in the church. And he's writing to a church in Galatia. And he's writing about an encounter that he has with the leaders there. One of them is Peter, Jesus' best friend. 
And he actually opposes Peter, two leaders, he opposes Peter face to face. And he has this to say about it in chapter 2 of, of Galatians. It says, but when I, Paul, saw that their conduct, the leaders, was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, who is Peter, before them all, if you, a Jew, live like a Gentile and not a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles then to live like a Jew? And let me just kind of sum that up real fast. Peter was in, was in this church hanging out with Jews and Gentiles. And before Jesus' time, if you know anything about that, they did not mix. And it wasn't until Jesus came and said, I came for everybody, not just the Jews. I came for the Gentiles, all the non-Jews. Well, when some Jewish leaders came into town, Peter, who was hanging out with everybody, all of a sudden said, well, I'm just going to hang out with the Jews. And Paul comes, he sees what's going on, and he says, no, 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 Peter. I don't care if you're best, best friends with Jesus or not. I don't care if you're one of the great leaders in the church or not. Guess what? That's not our gospel. You are out of step. You are out of line. You're a jerk. That's not what the leaders are supposed to do. And if it can happen to the leaders, if it can happen to the leaders, and you don't have to, to look very far to see some Christian leaders who have been some Christian jerks, you've got to know that it can happen to us. They, to put it simply, why are Christians such jerks? We get out of line with the gospel. We get out of step. So how then do we get out of step? Two things I'm going to take you through today to maybe give you some handles, some spiritual dynamics to give us some handles on how you and I um, struggle with being jerks sometimes. Well, first one is we simply get in the way. We get in the way of Jesus. Okay, You get this because you drive a car. You drive a car, let's say it is well, for the white, right rock people, you guys are all upset right now because just driving a car is not fun, especially if you're coming up to Los Alamos. But let's say it's, it's uh, 7 a.m., 8 a.m., you're going to the lab, everybody's going to be getting ready to go to school next week, so all that traffic increases, and what? You're driving along, and then what? Somebody cuts you off. Somebody gets in your way. They have their own vision, and they're either what? They, only, they see what they see and they think they got a hold so they can make it and they cut you off. Or they just don't care and they cut you off. Well, they get in our way. Well, we get in Jesus' way as well. And we cut him off from the work that he wants to do. And church people are so, so good at this. Because why? We have our own vision. We see things the way we want to see them. Everybody came in here today, I'm telling you, every single one of you came in here today with a vision of how you expect things to go here. What it's going to look like, what it's going to feel like, which songs we're going to sing, the preaching style. If, if we had carpet in here, you'd be like, I think we need this carpet. Christians all the time have thoughts and ideas, and if you've been in church life for long, what? We love to voice out all of those thoughts on how we think things should look and feel. And it's okay to have opinions and those sorts of things, but we get in the way and we hijack what God is trying to do, what Jesus is trying to do. And in the name of Jesus, we shame other Christians because they don't do it the way we want them to do it. They're not dressed. I've heard people be like, well, look at them. They're wearing jeans with holes in them. They got flip-flops going to church. You're supposed to wear the most respectful stuff that you have for God. And, and they must not be Christians then because of what they're wearing. And it gets ridiculous. We are supposed to be known. What? Jesus gave one command. At the end of his life, he said, I want to sum up all of this into one rule. Because people ask all the time, what's the rules at Freedom Church? One. Because Jesus gave one. He says, I give you a new command. Love one another as I have loved you. That's what you're... And then he said, the whole world will know that, that you are mine. They will, they will know me by how you love one another. But what? We look like idiots when we infight. And we go over all this stuff. We are known for how we fight with one another more than how we love one another. And we get in the way. Well, guess what? This happened with the disciples too. This happened with, with Jesus' own followers and he had to correct this with them as well. He said in Mark chapter 8, 
Jesus had just told his disciples um, that he was going to start his church, and we're going to talk about that in two weeks. But right after he said, hey, I'm going to start my church. This is his thing. Like, even the hell can't even stop what this thing is going to do. Then he says, but guess what, guys? Before that starts, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. The leaders, they're not going to like me. In fact, they're going to execute me. But it's okay, because on the third day, I'm going to raise from the, from the dead. I'm going to be alive again. And Peter, Peter, Cephas, the best friend, confronts Jesus. And this is where we pick it up. It says in, in verse 32, it says, As he, Jesus, talked openly with his disciples about this, Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Anybody want to reprimand Jesus? Anybody want to rebuke Jesus? <laughs> That's not a good place to be, but here's, here's Peter. This is why we can all relate to him. This is why we can all relate to him. He re re reprimands Jesus in front of them. He, Jesus turns around and he looks at his disciples. I would love, I don't know if I would love, because um, I would love to have been one of those disciples. <laughs> he turned around and looked at his disciples. I want to know what that look was. Because I can just imagine, I know with my kids, hey, you need to go to bed. Hey, you need to eat your food. Hey, you need to clean up the mess. And then they're like, nope. And I just know some of the looks that I have. I'm just like, oh, I, got, I got this vein coming out. I'm like, I'm looking, trying to cold my breath, trying to get calm. Like, I don't know what that look was. I don't know if he was just like, oh, hell no. You did not just say that. Because in Mike Brake translation, as I read it, that's pretty much what he tells him. He looks at his disciples. He looks at his disciples and he says this. He reprimands Peter. He says, get away from me, Satan. Excuse me, Jesus. Jesus. Um, there's, you sure you want that one in Scripture? I mean, you know, you're the, you're the leader of this thing. And we're kind of talking about jerks. And uh, I mean, hey, Zeus, come on. That's, uh, that's pretty strong language. You want to you wanna maybe, you know, we've got some guys writing things down. You want to rewrite that one? No, uh-uh. In fact, here's why. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not God's. Human perspective, we get in the way. And, he, and he's not calling him Satan. Okay, he's just saying, you're operating under his authority. And Peter, I have a mission. It is God's mission, not your mission. And so I'm going after his kingdom. And guess what, Peter? If, if, if you're going to go about it that way, that's fine. I love you, man. But we're going to have to part ways. Because I'm about what God is. And if you're going to go about what you want and you're going to get in my way of that, we're going to have to part. And this is going to be the end of our story. And the sad part is for most Christians today, if we were in that position, if we were in Peter's position, we would have walked. Jerk. No way. He's trying to do all these things. That's a, it's a terrible plan. Who, what right does he have to say that to me? What, how, how is he going to speak that into my... He doesn't know me. You don't know me. You don't know what I've been through. And we would have walked. Listen, the picture of Christianity is this. We're supposed to... Jesus says, I came that you might have life and have it to its full and so the picture of Christianity is us like a cup that's being poured where Jesus pours into us and then out of that being filled up, it just overflows into our lives and that overflow comes out. I'd be a terrible waiter, by the way. But instead of getting our cup filled with Jesus, like we talked about the past couple of weeks, getting to know him, share a meal with him, getting to hear him, we approach God like this. Where anything that's poured out what gets poured in gets poured right back out. And we come at him with our own vision and our own ideas and our own agendas and our own pride and we say, this is how it's got to get done. And Jesus, he wants no part of that. We will take this not only within Christian infighting, but we will take this into the world that we're supposed to be reaching for Jesus. 
And we will, we will, we will bring it into politics. We will bring it into the world of... of uh, I, I had a lady uh, a couple years ago that was just like, it's my conviction to make it your conviction that you need to homeschool your kids. No? That's your conviction, but that's not, that's not a command in Scripture. But we will take it, we will take our view of things, see it how we want to see it, call it how, how we see it, and we will put that on everybody else. And we will put that on transgenders, we will put that on homosexuals, and we will put that on the, in, the, in the world of morality. And we will try to force that onto everybody else. And I know what some of you are thinking, because I'm thinking the same thing. You're like, Mike, they're blatantly sinning. What about the people who are blatantly sinning? Don't you got to tell them the truth, right? And I'll just, whatever it is, I, th those are sermons for another time, okay? So I'll just give it to you. Whatever, whatever that issue is for you, be it I hate Democrats, I hate Republicans, I hate this, like everybody's just warring with one another and Christians try to shove it down their throats. I'll just give it to you that you're right, okay? But what are we supposed to be about? What if they're blatantly sinning? There's a, another group of disciples that ran across this. It says when, when the disciples James and John, like if the, Jesus had 12 disciples, Peter was one of the closest, closest one, and then if you want to try to categorize them, these two were, were next in line, if not right there with them. Three of the closest people next to Jesus. James and John, they're passing through an area of Samaria, and that town rejected them. They were going to stay there, and they said, get out. So, when the disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, you want us to call down fire from heaven to consume them? They rejected us. They rejected you, Jesus. They rejected the truth. Go to get them. And what do you think Jesus said? Yeah. Tell them they're going to hell, man. Let's bring fire down on these guys. Let's get them. Thief on the cross, mocking Jesus in his final moments, cries out to Jesus and says, Jesus, take me with you, man. What did Jesus do on the cross in his final breath? Did he say, no, man, your time's up. You've rejected me your whole life. Here's the truth, man. You're going to hell. Enjoy it. Not our Savior. Not our Savior. We get in the way. We get in the way of what our Savior tries to do. What does he tell his disciples? He says, and he turned, again, he turned and he rebuked them. Jesus only rebuking Satan. Jesus only rebuking evil. And here he's rebuking his disciples. Why? Because he says, and they went on to another village. Some of your, some of your translation says, you're, you're not of my spirits. You're operating under Satan's authority here. And he lets them have it. Here's, here's how scripture says. Someone's blatantly sinning. How do we address this? This is um, from the message, which is a paraphrase, but I love, I love this because I think it's going to speak to you. This is out of Galatians chapter 6. It says, live creatively, friends. If someone falls into sin, forgivingly restore them. Think about like a doctor helping someone who has a broken arm. They're going to they're gonna, they're gonna slowly mend that thing together. It's a process. They're, not, they're, not, they're going to work with that person gently. Gently to restore that bone. He says, forgivingly restore them. Saving your critical comments for yourself. You, you might be needing forgiveness before the day's out. Stoop down and reach out to those who are oppressed. Share their burdens and so complete what? Christ's law. If you think you're too good for that, you are badly deceived. You are fighting for the wrong team. Listen, at Freedom Church, at Freedom Church, we're about truth. We are about truth. But Jesus in John 1, he came full of truth and he came full of grace. And we are not about condemnation. We are about loving people no matter where they are at. We are about loving people who are complete opposite of us. I can think of no better demonstration of the gospel of Jesus Christ than loving someone who is completely opposite of you, who even holds completely different moral values than you, and you still loving them. Why? Because they are human beings created in the image of God whom God loves. They have a soul and Jesus died for every single one of them. And I will not apologize for that whatsoever. Freedom Church. Freedom Church. 
we come to love and share the love of Jesus Christ. Jesus is coming one day to judge. And we're going to talk about this next week. He is coming to judge. But he said, hey, I did not come to judge. I came to save. So his first trip to earth was to save. And that's still his agenda. That's still his purpose. One day he will come back and then it will be too late and he will judge then. But right now we are about that business of saving and seeing him save the lives of people. We get in the way. We get in the way. We all have our own vision of how this should work. And we get in our own way. So how did Jesus have the audacity to say this to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. How did he have the capacity to say this and, and not be a jerk? We get a clue of how Jesus lived his life. You see it throughout the Gospels. But one, I'll just point out one in Luke chapter 5. It says, but Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. He sat down and had a meal. The relationship with God. How do you know God? You have, it's like having a meal with them. He let him speak. He, he sat down at the table of God often and he got filled up. And it overflowed out of his life. If we're operating out of this, like Jesus, he operated out of wholeness, not out of brokenness. But for many of us as Christians, instead of operating out of wholeness, we're operating like this. And no matter how much gets poured in, it's never going to fill. See, if I, if I have, if I'm full and I'm overflowing, and there's, there's people in a dry land who are thirsty, what? I can, I can take this out and I can give you a little bit of drink. I can, out of my overflow, I can give you a drink and I can give you a drink and I can give you a drink and, and, and help some people out and point them where to get some water for themselves. But guess what? If, if, I, if I go to everyone here, it's not going to be too long before what? This cup is, is empty. And I've got to always remember, he often withdrew the picture of the relationship with God is always coming back to the table to get filled back up. And instead of operating sideways with God, we operate out of our brokenness. And for some of us in this room, we, if we're going to make any traction here, you, don't know why, you want to know why people think Christians are jerks? Because we're fake right now. We can't admit I have not yet forgiven that person. We can't admit that, that the reason I'm lashing out is because I have so much undealt anger with and bitterness. We can't admit that we're, we're <gasps> wrong sometimes and say that we're, we're sorry. That we're broken. And I'm here to tell you today that Jesus knows your brokenness and he still loves you. You can come here today and be honest before your Savior. Say, I'm broken. And I've been operating out of this for too long. See, all those people that Jesus healed that came to the crowd, tried to fight through the crowd, they all had to come to a point where they said, Jesus, I'm broken. And I need healing. You ain't going to find healing in your life until you really admit, hey, I, I need some help here. I'm not perfect. And the good news is, the good news is, Jesus restores brokenness. He doesn't, like, I'll get some tape, tape that thing back up. You know, you, you got to do some work, man. You really, you really jack that up, man. Go do some work. No. He wants you to take your brokenness and make it something beautiful. He just heals it. He just completely restores it. But you've got to be willing to admit that I'm broken and that I need help. And there's no shame in that. He wants you to take your weaknesses, those areas of failure, those areas of shame, those areas of mistake that you're holding on to. I'm broken, I'm broken, I've done all these things, I've had all these things. Give it to him. He wants to take those weaknesses and end up making them strength. One of the most difficult people that I think Jesus encountered in life was one of the guys closest to him, Judas. 
the man who betrayed him, the man who sold him out. And on the night that he did that, on the night that Judas sold him out, he told the guys, he told the, the guards, he said, I'm going to go to the garden, and when I, when I go to the garden, I'm not going to just point out the one and say, get him. I'm going to go to him, and I'll give him a kiss. What a jerk. What a jerk. You know what Jesus did when Judas came? You know what he said to him? Judas comes, gives him a kiss on the cheek. He said, my friend, my friend, do what you came to do. See, Jesus, I believe, I believe if Judas would have handed Jesus his brokenness, he would have healed him. He would have healed him. He could have healed him. My friend, do what you came here to do. He didn't strangle him. Peter, what did he do? Grabbed the sword, took it. Let's fight. Boom. Chops the guy's ear off. It's in scripture. You can read it. And what did Jesus do? Say, go get him? No. No, no, no. I got my mission. Peter, you're interrupting my mission again. You're seeing things from the human perspective again, Peter. No, no, no. We don't do that here. Not here. Not in this church. Not in this way. We're about God's kingdom. You stay here long enough, you're going to find a jerk. It's going to upset you, and I'm, I'm sorry about that. You've been in church the world long enough, and maybe this is your first time here in a while, and you've been burned. I'm sorry. Really, there's no excuse for the, that, that at all. But I also have not ever given up on the church because Jesus hasn't. He came for the broken. He came for the, for the, the ones who are ashamed. He came for the ones who are good. He came for the ones who need healing. And today, today, maybe you for the first time need to admit in a while or the first time forever that I'm broken and I need healing. That's a start. That's a step. You may not even know what you need healing from and that's okay, but you know I've been too prideful to admit that this is me. We are an imperfect church serving a perfect Savior. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay. Let's stand. Let's pray. Let's pray together for our closing prayer.